Welcome everybody to the third session, third JLI class. I'm going to share the screen now, and here we go. Okay, second. Superhumans versus superhumans. That is the topic for tonight. Superhumans versus superhumans. Right. Let's see what JLI has in store for us today. So. The first thing we got to do tonight is we have to ask ourselves, what, why do we do a mitzvah? Okay, why, why do we do a mitzvah? Ask yourself, why do we do a mitzvah? And look at the, look at in front of you, reward versus results. Okay, it's very important. What does it mean, reward versus results? Okay. Let me just share this again. So reward versus result. Look at look at look at this uh, textbook in front of you. Have it. Choose any mitzvah, right? Choose any any mitzvah you want, and take a uh, you know something you do regularly. So take Shabbat, keep kosher, give charity, fill in, study Torah, and to ask yourself the following question: Why do you do this? Why do you give charity? Why do you put on tefillin? Why do you light Shabbat candles? For what possible reason do you do it? So there could be, you know, so different people will say different things. Some people say, you know, because God said so. Other people say it makes my life more orderly, it's stable, makes my life more spiritual, strengthens my Jewish identity. Some people say it feels right. It makes the world a better place. I believe that God will reward me. You know, some people are afraid to disobey God or, you know, other reasons. But, you know, why we do mitzvahs, why we do what we do, how we do it, why do we do it? Alexander, shalom, shalom aleichem. For those joining us on Zoom, on Facebook, on YouTube, we welcome you all. So let's look at text number one in the books in front of us. Um, and this is a quote from last week's Parsha, where it says, God says, In If you follow my statutes, and you keep my mitzvot, it says, I will provide your rains in their proper time. The earth will give its produce and the tree of the field will yield their fruits. So that means on a simple basic level, that when we do a mitzvah, God will reward us. You do something good, God will pay you. It's like a contract, like work, you know, you work, you work hard, you get paid, right? You get paid your $10,000 at the end of the year, or 50, or $100,000. You do a mitzvah, you put on film, God, oh, please send me the reward. Right? That's how we normally view it. And in tonight's class, we'll see that it's much, much, much more complicated um, than that. But, you know, in Tanya, those of you who have the source in front of you, text number two, it says, the ultimate perfection of the age of Mashiach and the resurrection, namely the revelation of the infinite radiance of God in this physical world, depends on our action and our work throughout the duration of exile. Let me like this. If we do mitzvahs, if we act well in this world, we will bring the spiritual revelation of Mashiach. Because Schar Mitzvah, you know what the reward of the Mitzvah? Is the Mitzvah itself. This is because with the performance of a Mitzvah, one brings down God's radiance, the Shekhinah, and into the physical matter of this world. And we'll explain what that means there in a moment. But what happens is, when we do mitzvahs, we are bringing Mashiach. We are making the world a better place. We are refining the world. Okay, and if you look at this chart in front of you, reward versus results. Okay, is a mitzvah where you get dollars a reward or is it a result? So, what does that mean? Okay, so let's take the scenario of two different people. Okay, so one person works hard 20 years, working and working, working in a shoe factory, and he's making shoes. And he saves up enough money to buy a house after 20 years. So the house is a reward for his hard work, right? The guy works for 20 years. He puts aside money. He gets rewarded. That is a reward on the left-hand side of the screen in front of you. But scenario B is I buy bricks and cement and other materials to build the house. The house is the result of my hard work, right? I buy bricks. I buy mortar. I buy materials. And I build a house. So the house is not a reward. The house is a direct result. And this is a very, very, very important difference because when we look at mitzvahs, are they, are they a result or are they a reward? 
This year, by the way, as Benjamin, you mentioned on Facebook, is dedicated to our brothers and sisters in Israel. This is my, I mean, I cannot bear to even look away from what's happening in Israel just for a moment. We pray and, 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 and this Torah is dedicated for our people in Israel, whoever's we'll listening on YouTube as well as Facebook as well as Zoom, dedicated for our brothers and sisters in Israel. Their pain is our pain, their suffering is our suffering. And whatever they're going through is what we're going through. And my brother just texted me right now in Petah Tikva. He woke up his whole family. He had to run into the Mamad, into the Miklat. And he had a direct hit in Petah Tikva on the street in front of him. Thank God there were no Nifkaim uh, then, but it's insanity what's going on. So when you do a mitzvah, it's not just a good deed that God rewards you. right? Sending Mashiach is not a reward, but, sending, but, but doing mitzvahs creates the home. Doing mitzvahs is not the left hand side of the reward. The result, it's a result. It's like when you building, when you do a mitzvah, you building a house. It's a result. The building of the house is the result. It's not a reward. So Mashiach is actually, as we'll see in this shear, the whole shear is about when you do a mitzvah, whether it's fitin, mitzvah, kashrut, whatever mitzvah you want, any one of the six hundred thirteen. What you're actually doing is you are creating the home. It's a result. Mashiach is not a reward. It's a result. And to understand how this is so. So, you know, we, last week we discussed what, what does it mean to you, Rabbi Tachonim? What does it mean that God wants a home for himself here below? You look at the screen in front of you. Um, what's a home? You know, when a person has a home, he feels, he feels himself. God wants this world to be his home where he can feel himself. Where he doesn't have to put on a show. He just feels himself. Now, I want to show you... Um, Oh, here is in the PowerPoint in front of you. So take a look at this. Okay, this is a this is a great, incredible parable for understanding what I'm about to explain. Okay, so you have on the left hand side a picture of a piano, beautiful piano, piano. So imagine you have these three pictures there. You know, the one with the hands, the one with the piano, and the one with the woodpecker. Imagine these three things are three different worlds. Universe one is our world. Universe two is exactly like our world, but with one difference. There's no music in this world. In its entire history, nobody, nobody ever heard of music. Sorry about that. Just so universe one is our world where we know about music, everything, you know, we know piano, we know music, we know the organ, we know instruments, perfect. Universe two, which is the middle right, this middle circle in front of you, is where they never heard of music, but besides for that, everything is the same as our world. And universe three, has no human beings inside of it. The only thing that's inside this world is woodpeckers. Now, this is a beautiful parable for understanding this. Now, you take object number one, which is that piano in the big picture in front of you, and you put it in universe one. Okay, beautiful, in our universe. So what's gonna happen? A human being is gonna walk past and he's gonna start playing on the piano and it's beautiful. He's gonna produce beautiful, wonderful, amazing music. Fantastic. Next, you place that same object in universe two. And if you ask people in this universe what they see, they never heard of music. They don't know what music is. They're going to walk past it. They may, they may think it's a great piece of furniture. Maybe they'll probably put a vase of flowers on it, as you see in the picture in front of you. Um, you know, maybe they'll put some framed photographs next to it, but they're not going to know what it is. You know, if, if there's somebody who's technically savvy in that world, maybe they'll say it's some sort of instrument, but they will have no idea what it is. And then you take universe three, where there's only woodpeckers. You put that object in universe three, and those woodpeckers, because it's an object of wood, will climb over it and start pecking, 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 pecking. And the point of here is the following. You see, the limited awareness in uni universe number two basically obscures the true nature of the object. And in universe three, there's such a great concealment that they don't even know what you're talking about. They think it's a piece of wood, this great musical piece of art. They think it's a piece of wood and they just peck at it. And the same thing is with our world. Our world is like that piano. You can experience our world like a flock of woodpeckers blind to everything other than the most materialistic and physical part of the universe. But the rest of it, the spirituality, the awe, the majesty of this world, we are totally and utterly blind to. We're pecking at it. We like the wood. 
You see, our existence is much, much more than the material. It's spiritual, it's deep, it's godly. But we have to discover beyond the concealment, like we learned last week, the hell, and beyond that, the majesty, the beauty, the godliness, and the purity. We need to learn how to play that piano. And that is what the mitzvahs are all about, as we will discover very, very soon. The mitzvahs is from the beginning to the end. The mitzvah is about discovering and revealing and uncovering the majesty of the world. Okay, so how do the mitzvahs work? In every single mitzvah, and again, no matter what the mitzvah is, plays a double role in accomplishing this goal. As we'll see in a moment. Okay? So in Tanya, text number three, those of you who have the Tanya in front of you, um, it, says like, it says like this. Chapter 37 of Tanya says like this. I'm going to read it. Through the performance of a mitzvah, a person causes a flood of God's infinite light to descend from above and being clothed within the material of the world, within an object that was previously under the dominion of it, whose existence depended on the spiritual forces that obscure the godly reality. This includes all things that are kosher and permissible. For example, the parchment used in fill in a mezuzah Torah scroll, an etrog, so long as it is not orla, which is forbidden, money given to charity, so long as it is not being dishonestly acquired. When one uses these objects to perform God's mitzvah and thereby fulfill his express desire, the vivifying force ascends and is absorbed within God's infinite light. When you do any mitzvah, you draw down God's shechina, his divine presence, you're drawing it down into the world. That is one Item that is one thing that is universal to every single mitzvah. But then there's a second thing, which is a lot deeper than that. And he continues in Tanya like this. There are two aspects to every mitzvah. One aspect is the fact that with every mitzvah that we do, we fulfill God's will, right? You do a mitzvah, you're doing what God wants. In this regard, there's no difference between one mitzvah and the next. An individual fulfills the mitzvah not because of its unique qualities and its unique effects, but simply to carry out God's will. This aspect of the mitzvah is aptly demonstrated in the observation of Rav Hashanah, Zaman, of Yadid, that if we were commanded to chop wood, we would do it in obedience to the divine will with the same enthusiasm as we fulfill the mitzvah of Tzvah. So one aspect is you just fulfilling God's will. But the second aspect is that each mitzvah brings a spiritual refinement to the individual performing the mitzvah. Similarly, the mitzvah brings a spiritual refinement to the objects with which it is performed and ultimately, ultimately refines the world. So with the first aspect of the mitzvah, you're actually doing something with every mitzvah. Every mitzvah, you're doing God's will and you're drawing down his presence. But the second part of the mitzvah, of every mitzvah, is that with this mitzvah, you are refining this particular aspect. With tefillin, it's tefillin. With orla, with kilaim, with kilia karim, with kosher, with any kind of mitzvah, whatever you're doing, you're fulfilling, drawing down and revealing that aspect of the world, as I'll explain in a moment. Okay. Let's let, second. Um, let's go to text number six as follows. Okay, those are the book in front of you. Text number six. God did not leave anything in the world without providing the people. I'm sorry. To look at the screen in front. Of you. you reveal what was there, but we didn't previously see. That's our purpose. So in the screen in front of you, you see what we just learned. Function A of every mitzvah is a general fulfillment of God's will. And function B is the specific spiritual refinement. So with every mitzvah, you have function A and function B. Function A is you generally fulfilling God's will. It's wonderful. You're drawing down God's presence and everything's great. And that's extremely important. But function B is the specific spiritual refinement of that candles, of that challah, of that kiddush, of that thing, which is how we create a home for God in this world, as we will see momentarily. Okay, function A is penetrating concealment. God is concealed. We need to reveal him. And function B, every single mitzvah engages a different part of ourselves. And I'm going to explain that now. Let me read to you inside text number six from the Medrash. Okay, God did not leave anything in the world without providing the people of Israel with the means of performing a mitzvah with it. 
So a person proceeding to plow must see, do not plow with an ox and a donkey together. If one wishes to sow, do not sow kilaim in your vineyard. Reap. When you reap your harvest in your field, leave any forgotten sheaths for the poor. Thresh, do not muzzle an ox while it is threshing. Knead dough from the first of your kneading bowl. Remove eggs from a nest, send away the mother bird. Slaughter a wild animal with felt, cover its blood with soil. Plant a tree, you have to observe the mitzvah. Bury a deceased relative, do not mourn excessively by slashing yourself a group. Take a haircut, do not shave the corners of your head. Build a house, there's a mitzvah to build a house. Install a safety fence around it. Wear a garment that has four corners, they shall make for themselves seat seats. So that means like this, performing mitzvot, so transforms God into this world, like we don't function A, but function B in a specific way. Every single mitzvah is associated with a certain part of this world. And when we do all the mitzvahs, we are refining the entire universe, the entire world. Okay, to fill in, helping somebody, that's Rosh Hashanah, apple dipped in honey, helping an elderly person, charity, Okay, look at the source in front of you on the screen. In a general way, just cover this a second. In a general way, right, this is the mitzvah's dual impact. In a general way, every mitzvah action counteracts the inherently selfish self perception of physical reality and reinforces a truth that exists only to serve a higher purpose. You see, the world is really selfish. What does it mean, selfish? The world says, I exist. Nothing else exists in this world. I exist. But the truth is that the world doesn't exist. God is the true person who exists. So when you do a mitzvah, you are removing a layer of that ego of the world. But then number two, every mitzvah in a specific way, each mitzvah makes a particular part of the world more spiritually refined, more generous, more aware, more respectful, more loving, more connected, right? So every single mitzvah has that aspect to it, okay? Now, let me just show you the video. This video explains very, very clearly how this works, how this is so. Hold on, let me just share this again. The sound of this part. Okay, watch this video. <laughs> Muster an army of workers, machines, factories, ships, trains, and endless natural supplies. What do you get? A pencil. In 1958, Leonard Reed penned a classic to document the mind-boggling diversity of materials and skilled labors required for a single manufactured object. He detailed the production of a pencil, speaking in the pencil's voice. My family tree begins with a cedar of straight grain. Contemplate all the saws and trucks and rope and the countless other gear used in harvesting and carting the cedar logs to the railroad siding. Think of all the persons and the numberless skills that went into the fabrication of these logging tools. The mining of ore, the making of steel and its refinement into saws, axes, motors, the growing of hemp and bringing it through all the stages of heavy and strong rope. Reed describes railroad networks and communication systems that bring the logs to mills and the mill work that produces thin slats. He asks, how many skills went into supplying the heat, the light and power, the belts, motors, and all the other things a mill requires? Reed includes the workers who constructed the hydro plant that supplies the mill's power, trains that transport the slats, a factory that cost millions to erect and equip with brilliant machines that slit the slats and insert the lead, and the lead itself, produced by mixing graphite mined in Sri Lanka with clay from Mississippi and treating it with Mexican wax. The pencils receive six coats of lacquer and are labeled with carbon black mixed with resins. An eraser holder made of zinc and copper is attached, and black nickel rings are added. Finally, the pencil's eraser is a rubber-like product made with Indonesian rapeseed oil, Italian pumice, sulfur chloride, vulcanizing and accelerating agents, and cadmium sulfide. One pencil, millions of dollars, dozens of countries, thousands of miles, 
but we can add something radical that Reed never considered. What if this pencil belongs to David, who uses it for Torah classes? It helps him observe the mitzvah of Torah study. That changes everything. Divinity, generated by his mitzvah, illuminates his soul and body, and elevates the pencil as well. That powerful, godly light travels back along the pencil's production route, elevating the factory, railroads, minerals, investments, skills, lives, and all that Reed so vividly described. Think about that the next time you offer charity. Light a Shabbat candle or wind tefillin around your arm. With each mitzvah act, so much of this world is connected with divinity. That video is a, just a beautiful way to explain, oh, one second, how every mitzvah we do brings Mashiach. Okay? What happened is, you see, every single mitzvah transforms a piece of this world into a home for God. So how does it transform the entirety of creation? Simple. You know, what percentage of the world's GNP is donated to charity? What percentage of the world's animal hides are made into parchment to use for tefillin, right? The truth is that every single one of our acts has many, 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 many other actions. Um, as you saw with the pencil. Right, with every object that we use, the world is interconnected. The textbook that you're holding in front of you um, may have been printed in China, transported on a ship built in Holland. The software with which it was designed may have been developed in California, and the person who did the layout may have trained in a school in Australia. So when I am now putting learning Torah with a textbook now, I'm elevating all those objects. I'm not just elevating the actual book and paper that I have in front of me right now. The fact that we're sitting here today on Zoom, on Facebook, on YouTube, on the internet, and people who will watch this is, is, is an incredible, I mean, think about that. You know, the, the guy you invented, Mark Zuckerberg, and then you have Google guy, and the YouTube guy, and, you, and, and all the effort they toil they put into it, and we are now elevating that consciousness. That is a Shia. Right in the beginning of the class, I asked you, why do you do a mitzvah? There were so many different answers. Why do we do a mitzvah? It could be for so many reasons. But one of the mitzvah all the way back makes me feel good, it's good, it's a reward, all, everything's great, but it's also to bring Mashiach. When you do a mitzvah, you are refining the world, you are bringing God into this world, but you're also refining a specific aspect of the world and bringing Mashiach closer. And here we get to a point where the question is, are you an employee or are you a partner? And as we'll see in a moment, when God created the world, he made every single one of us a partner. He didn't want us to work for him. As an employee, he wanted us to become a partner. As it says in our Friday night prayers, the Talmud says, the Torah considers, text number seven, those who recite the passage of Vayachulu during the eve of Shabbat prayers, as if they become partners with God in the work of creation. Right? What does it mean to be a partner? If you, have a, if, if you have a business partner versus if you have an employee, so, you know, the, the, if you just observe from a distance, they're both doing their job, they're both working, you know, they, it's great, nine to five, they're both in office. But if you really, really examine the difference between an employee and a partner, you'll notice there's something totally different. The employee wants to do his job, he wants to get paid, but he doesn't really, really, really care about the vision. The partner cares about the vision. The partner cares about the long-term plan. The partner is in it for the long haul. So let's say you're investing in a startup. Employee wants to get paid. I want to get my $100,000 salary, whatever it is. The partner, the one who's invested in the company, he may not care that did not take a salary for the first couple of years because he's looking at the big picture. He's believed in the product. As Jews, we are partners with God in the creation of the universe. We don't just work for God and say, okay, I'll work for God from nine to five every day. I'll do mitzvahs, I'll learn Torah, I'll study, I'll do, I'll do good deeds. And then I'm, I'm out, I'm done. And no, we are partners, we are invested. We want to bring Mashiach together. We want to have the culmination, the ultimate revelation, the ultimate perfection of the world. We're in it for the, wrong, for the long haul. 
You know, Microsoft is a huge company with tens of thousands of employees, software developers, salespeople, assembly line workers, managers, PR people, accountants, secretaries, security guards, drivers, maintenance people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They each have to know how to do their specific job. But do they know what the overall purpose of the company, why it was founded and what it wants to achieve? Theoretically, they could do their job without knowing that. But if you have a CEO of a company, he's going to want the employees to know as much as possible what the big, big plan is, what they really, really want out of their company. And it will motivate them in a tremendous way. Can you imagine if they are a partner of Microsoft versus an employee of Microsoft? They'll be invested much, much, much more in the company. Text number eight, I'm going to read it for you. A Duke can argue practically, why is it important for me to know that the redemption will arrive someday? I need to do my work, fulfill that which God instructs me to do. It's not my business to know, be concerned with the great objectives and the results of my service. The foolishness of this approach should be self-understood, but here's an illustration. Imagine a soldier in the middle of the battle, standing up and saying, it's not my business to know why my commanding officer gave me an order to fire my weapon. All that is important is that I meticulously follow the orders handed down by the chain of command. The fact that my actions impact the outcome of the battle, causing the enemy to retreat and bringing my side close to victory is irre irrelevant to me. I just need to shoot my rifle. So this shoulder, soldier, even though he does what he, he lacks moral, he lacks passion, and will negatively impact his performance in the battlefield. Same is true regarding a Jew who serves God with Torah and mitzvot. We cannot claim that we don't care whether our efforts will succeed or the long-awaited victory will come or not. We have to know that there's a campaign underway and that is our mission to bring to its successful conclusion. We must be keenly aware of the reality with each additional mitzvah we reveal more godliness in this world, thereby moving a step closer to the ultimate triumph. We are soldiers in the army of God. We are fighting the war and we are partners. We have to know about the big picture. We are in it together to fight. Look at the screen in front of you. You have an employee and you have a partner. Employees, it's just job description, but the partner is interested in and is invested in the mission statement. The mission statement of the Jew is to bring Moshiach. That's what we are here for. That is what we are doing. We are here to bring Moshiach. Okay, an employee is interested in the reward. He's going to get a salary, but the partner is interested in the result. He's Bigger picture, much, much, much bigger picture. That is a Jew. That is what we are. That is the fundamental difference and approach with what we do. And that is why in text number nine, we learn in Pirkei Avot, in Ethics of Our Fathers, it says, Antigno said, do not be servants who serve their master for the sake of the reward, rather be as servants who serve their master and not for the sake of the reward. In Judaism, the fact that we do a mitzvah, that is the reward. We don't need to be rewarded with gold and silver and diamonds. The reward is the connection to God. The reward is that we are now focused on the big picture. The reward is now we are a step closer to our vision, which is Mashiach. That's the reward for us. So when we see Mashiach as something that's actually happening, it brings about our passion much, much, much further, much, much more. Okay, text number 10a, it says like this. The 12th out of the 13 principles of faith is the era of Mashiach. That is to believe and affirm that he will come and not to think that he will be delayed. Text number 10b, anyone who does not believe in Mashiach or does not expectantly await his coming denies not only the other prophets, but also the Torah and our teacher Moses. Text number 10c, I mean, I believe with perfect faith. In the coming of Mashiach, and although he may tarry, I expectantly await his coming every single day. Okay, text number 11 is a beautiful story. You know, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi one time found Elijah the prophet. Right? Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi found Elijah the prophet. Look at the text around you. Believe and affirm that Mashiach will come. Do not think that he will be delayed. That's the founding principle. Okay, and again, look at the screen in front of you, an employee doesn't need to believe in the company's success. Partner certain of the success of the company. That is why he is there. Okay. So Rabbi Yeshua Levi one time, 
he found he found Elijah the prophet and he asked him when is the Mashiach coming this is a very famous story and in fact there's a song a Hasidic song made about this um, this story he said when's Mashiach coming so uh, Elijah the prophet told you Rabbi Yeshua ben go ask him yourself why are you asking me go ask him yourself so Rabbi Yeshua ben says where am I supposed to find him where should I find Mashiach so Elijah the prophet told him, no problem he is located at the gateway of the city of Rome. So Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi asks Elijah the prophet, well, how am I going to recognize him? And it's like saying he's on Fifth Avenue, Times Square. There's a million people in Times Square. In that, those days, Rome was the center of the universe. Today, New York is. So he was in Times Square. Well, how am I supposed to find him? So Elijah the prophet said, he's sitting among the poor, the poverty-stricken paupers, the beggars, and he suffers from illnesses. All the others untie all their bandages at once, right? They untie all their bandages and then they tie them again. But he unties and rebandages each wound separately because he thinks maybe I'm going to be needed now to bring the to, to to attend to the world and I must not be delayed, right? So again, every single one of those beggars used to untie all their wounds from their hands, from their feet, from their legs, from their bodies, and then they used to tie them again. And, uh, and Mashiach, what he did was he untied his hand dressed the wound, and then he tied it again. He went his other hand, went his leg. Why did he do that? In case he is needed immediately. So Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi went to him and he says, Hi, how are you? Shalom Aleichem. And Mashiach responded, Peace upon you, son of Levi. And then he says to him, Amosai Ka'osimara, the famous words, When are you coming? And Mashiach told him, Today. This was like, what, 2,000 years ago? He told today, I'm coming today. So Rabbi Yeshua came back to Elijah the prophet at the end of the day, and he said, Mashiach lied to me. He said he's coming today, and he didn't come. He lied. Elijah said, this is what he told you. He meant, Hayom im He meant today, if you will hearken to his voice. Mashiach wanted to impress upon Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi that really and truly today is coming. We should await Mashiach's coming every single day while there are rockets and missiles falling upon us in Israel today. Today we tell God we know we are absolutely certain that Mashiach is coming today. In retrospect, yesterday the Mashiach didn't come. So yeah, you know, I need to hearken more to God's voice. But Mashiach sees it, he's convinced that the moment of redemption is every single moment. So is this a realistic expectation? You see, here's the truth. The truth is, as you see in the screen in front of you, that we are in the middle of a horrific bad dream right now. What we see in front of us, especially with the fighting in Israel, is all a bad dream. It's not the reality. The reality is God. The reality is Moshiach. The reality is Torah. The reality is mitzvot. This world is concealment. The fact that Hamas can fire weapons upon us and now they unify it to the north with sirens in the north in Tel Aviv. I mean, it's crazy. The fact that they can even do this is a great, great concealment of godliness. It's not the truth. The truth is that we are asleep. And Moshiach is the reality. We think it's the other way around. We live in Manhattan, New York, and we have the world around us. Oh, Mashiach, it's like a fantasy. It's like a dream far away. Ah, 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 ah. It's the other way around. We are the ones who are dreaming. Mashiach is the reality. Okay, as it says, the Torah states, that the Spirit of God hovered over the surfaces of the water. That's Mashiach. And as we noted last week, from the time, from the moment that God created the world, Mashiach. And I want to read to you in text number 13, straight from the Rebbe. This is what the Rebbe says. We have been discussing the redemption in the era of Mashiach. Some in the audience are genuinely astounded at this. How can an individual appear in public? See, this is what the Rebbe is saying. People are complaining about me, says the Rebbe. I'm appearing in public week after week, and I mean repeatedly and unceasingly discussing a single topic, the coming of Mashiach. So moreover, this individual emphasized that he's not merely discussing the published Torah material on this topic, rather he's discussing our righteous Mashiach's actual coming in our tangible reality here on physical earth and immediately in this very day. This individual further instructs others to sing on each and every occasion. Shebon, Nebet, Samik, Dosh, Mimei, Rabbi, Yomim, Mimei, this temple be rebuilt. 
And he points out that speedily nowadays does not refer to the very near future, means quite literally speedily day. So the, today, so the Rebbe is saying, people are complaining about me that I actually believe Mashiach is coming today. Certainly, writes the Rebbe, every Jew believes that Mashiach can come at any moment. I await his coming every day. Nevertheless, they wonder, how is it justifiable to discuss this topic without let up? And to emphasize on each occasion, the Mashiach can come at that very moment. Is it not rather challenging to expect people to relate to Mashiach's imminence as if it were a tangible fact of our reality? So why does this individual speak incessantly about this on every occasion and with such single-minded intensity as if to forcefully ram the idea into the minds of his listeners? Their conclusion is that all this is a beautiful dream, nice, but not realistic. If so, they claim there's truly no point in discussing one's dreams in such length and such frequency. Truth, however, is the opposite. Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi delivered a discourse based on the verse when God returns the exiles of Israel. He explained it that our current state of exile is a dream because, in a dream, one sense of perception can tolerate the most contradictory and irrational things. In other words, our current reality is a dream, whereas the world of Mashiach is our true reality in a single moment. The situation can be reversed from one extreme to the other. We can awaken from the dream of exile and enter the true reality, Mashiach. If so, each and every individual present in this room certainly has the ability to make the redemption come immediately, not tomorrow, but right now. Or we even have a chance to recite the afternoon prayers. Simply stated, at this very moment, we open our eyes and see Mashiach of the flesh with us here in this room. You see, everything we do from moment, from morning till night, is a singular purpose. To bring Mashiach. Let's just play this video of the key points. Hold on. Lesson three Superhuman versus Superhumans. One. The purpose of creation, according to Hasidic teachings, is God's desire for a home in our material world and corporeal reality. 2. The physical world is referred to as the lowly world because it obscures the truth that God pervades every aspect of existence. Making the world a home for God means to penetrate this concealment and transform physical reality into a place that expresses the divine goodness and perfection. 3. The messianic world is not only a reward for doing mitzvot, but is the actual result of these actions. A mitzvah transforms the object with which it is performed from a self-defined existence into an instrument of God's will. In addition, each mitzvah makes a particular part of the world more receptive to spirituality, bringing it one step closer to expressing the divine goodness and perfection. 4. The mitzvot directly engage with only a small percentage of the physical universe and of each individual life, but each mitzvah action is the product of countless other actions and processes. In this way, the whole of creation is ultimately transformed. 5. The sages teach us that by doing mitzvot, we become a partner with God in the work of creation. There are a number of distinctions between a partner mentality and an employee mentality. A. An employee is driven primarily by his or her job description, whereas for the partner, the company's mission statement is the driving force. An employee is motivated by reward, whereas a partner is results-driven. C. A partner is confident of the success of the enterprise. 6. The twelfth foundation of Judaism, by Maimonides' count, is not only the belief that Mashiach will come, but also the daily anticipation of the redemption. When we understand that the true nature of reality is the divine goodness and perfection, the expectation of Mashiach's imminent coming is more realistic than the concealment that obscures this truth. Okay. So that is the summary of tonight's. Let me see if there.
Okay, so that's a summary of tonight's class. Um, yeah, we join us for the three more sessions every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. right here.